Ascent. My name is Pat Mancuso, the creator and host of our show. And today we have a very special guest with us that's going to talk to us about building wealth financially. He's going to talk about commercial real estate. He's going to talk about a book. So let me introduce you to uh, Jay Karras. So Jay Karras is a best-selling author on distressed commercial real estate, bringing 18 years of experience in real estate. So he's been sh through a shift or two uh, and uh, has been a featured national speaker on his expertise. Over the past six years, he's managed, developed, and acquired 200 million in projects and over 250 million in development in his pipeline. Jake loves to build relationships and communities. And above all, he's a family man. He's an author of the book, Catching Knives. He's got two adventurous boys and a newborn daughter, and of course, his wife. So welcome to the show, Jake. Thanks, Pat. It's it's, it's uh, always exciting to get to, uh, a chance to share some of these things and obviously with your audience, you know, what the value you're adding to them uh, the, on their entrepreneurial journey. Well, I love that. So, Jake, we always have some fun with our guests. It's like I read their bios, I read what's on paper, and then I, I say, well, tell us something about Jake that maybe isn't on paper or that somebody might not know that would surprise them. What would you say? Well, you know, uh, I would say actually right now, uh, usually I mentioned, you know, being in the army and I used to repel out of helicopters, but right now I am like uber fascinated and I've actually started a new kind of project around an NFT project launch. Um, I am, you know, actually started doing another book on it, recording that, that journey. I believe that NFTs are structurally going to change everything about business um, just as the dot com era yeah. uh, exploded everything, 99% of them were crap. Uh, equally, I believe the NFT space is going to experience that same explosion and and you know subsequent meltdown in it. But there can be some hugely profitable and uh, empires built yeah. off of that. And so that is what I am most excited about today. You know, it, it's kind of funny that you mentioned that, Jake. You know, I, I, I like a lot of people have probably pushed off the crypto, the blockchain, and now the, the you know, the NFTs. And, and, and yet, you know, when you, when you start to look at it, it's just with everything that's happening, it's kind of interesting. And I saw a post this morning that uh, 2011, if you bought it, would have bought, invested $100 in Bitcoin, it'd be $553,000 today. So, uh, you know what, it's probably time that we still look into that. So good for you. And are you going to have like an NFT of yourself or what's, it's, what's that going to look like? It's not going to be of me. Uh, okay. There's actually a character that we're, we're uh, working on that will kind of be, and really when I look at this from you know, specific to the, to the audiences, right. how do you build like a platform company? How do you build what you have? There's certain ways in which you can garner uh, additional layers of income from right. having a platform company. You can do vertical acquisitions. You can do horizontal acquisitions. You can expand your offerings. And, and that's where I'm kind of treating this is in a really like a business perspective of how do we take this rocket fuel put together an existing IRL in real life experiences and exponential. And it's going to be around the hospitality space. Okay, uh, I, I'm building a, a hotel on the river walk down in San Antonio. We have a couple of other hotel investments, but how that layers in with digital restaurant, ghost kitchens, um, the metaverse, you know, web three and, and then combining those and packaging uh, to really the hospitality component that I believe that is going to be very, very valuable into the future because the rich are getting richer. Yeah. The government just printed uh, $20 trillion. Yeah. So, uh, I, you know, at, at some point, I mean, Big Macs might be worth uh, a million dollars, you know, in a very short order with the levels of inflation. Yeah. So as the rich are getting richer, they're looking for more unique experiences. They are, I wouldn't say tired or, you know, been the beige hotel rooms, the branded Marriott's and Hilton's of the world. Um, they're looking for something unique and special. And I think this now, this NFT space, the character space around, um, maybe you've heard of the board apes, maybe yeah. you've heard of, you know, some of those is, yeah. is how do you layer that in creating also some, some layers of, of fashion, uh, music, experiential yeah. components and that we're all kind of running on that. And then, you know, we'll start uh, releasing some, some super cool 
uh, imagery. We're working with some some digital animators and some renders at a group out of uh, in Colombia. Uh, I invested into a coffee company down there that we happen to uh, connect up with their, you know, this animation studio, and, and sure. I'm very excited for for that. So not me. Uh, I although uh, I like to say you know it's it's my good looks that's why I, I'm brought onto most projects. Uh, it's usually probably my my math skills and in, in pro forma and modeling. I love it. I love it. So Jake, let's talk. You know, the success of Sen is about me pulling information out of uh, folks like you who have been on their entrepreneurial journey. You know, as CEOs, as investors, as authors. You know, and, and we know that success journey is you know, a lot of times upward and yet sometimes it's not always up. Sometimes it's backwards. Sometimes we, you know, learn a lot by some of the struggles. So as an entrepreneur, what have you learned? Like what are the big two or three things you've really learned in your entrepreneurial journey? Well, I think it's um, the long game, you know, sure. as far as uh, to, to give that I was, like you said, you know, I've been doing this for 20 years. I've been a professional investor since the early 2000s. I used to be, um, and maybe that as a parent, I also see this too, is that when your kids, you know, you give them advice and they think, man, my parents are super dumb. <laughs> um, I, I think like the, the advice that I got, got from the, uh, the, you know, call it the, salty seniors they were like hey be cautious that you know right. there's uh you know the real estate markets don't go up forever that there are some you know uh needs to underwrite you know i was just like oh man you just you just don't understand the real estate's never gone down never corrected um you know living up uh, and so i had a goal of becoming a millionaire before 30. okay and so i achieved that and I yeah. was like, great. So I had the uh, fortitude to, you know, without systems, without just being myopically focused on a goal of becoming a millionaire before 30. And then I kind of just stopped. I got yeah. it. I achieved it. 27, 28 years old. I'm a millionaire. I'm game over. Yeah. And the reality. And so that's kind of goes to that, that earlier point of is, is a long game. I love the book. Uh, James Clear, uh, Atomic Habits. Yes. Because you def goals are great for setting one-time success, but systems are for predictable and repeated success. And so you default to the level of your systems. So I did not have any systems in place through willpower and sheer just motivation of going to achieve this goal of becoming a millionaire before 30 but I didn't adapt it. I didn't add to the onto that, didn't develop new systems and new goals and new trajectories to what is the next version, what's the 28, 29, 30, 35, you know, 40 year old version. And it, it took me falling down fat on, flat on my face. You know, really, I remember I was sitting on a street corner down in Tucson mm -hmm. crying and I was praying. I was like, dear Lord, can I be worth no money? Cause I was actually had a negative net worth is I didn't develop skill sets to maintain a millionaire status, yeah. making it and then maintaining it are two sure. different skill sets. And so it was like, how do you look at this? And that's what I kind of dive into in the book. So the book is, you, you mentioned it, catching knives, a guide to investing in distressed commercial real estate. That's where I have a lot of experiences, but it's some of the systems that I had to put in place that create a business plan and that next level of, of strategy. Uh, Jay Papasan, um, I, I've been in a couple of events with him. And so he's Gary Keller's you know, right-hand man. They wrote the book, The One Thing. And one of the things that he discussed was when they are getting towards their goals and they actually see that they're achievable, like they're just at the edge of their thing, right? they move the goal line. Yep. They reset their goals. Yeah. And so to me, that was the other thing was as the young, you know, naive, you know, so smart, you know, like thing, I had to crash and burn and smash my face on the ground to spending time understanding the systems, diving into it, building them up, you know, from that kind of rock bottom component is 
how do you build long term? And yep. then understanding uh, leverage. And I say leverage, and most people think of a mortgage. They think of, you know, hey, leverage. And I say leverage is in every single aspect, leveraging a system, leveraging people, employees, yes. leveraging ideas, cool. and really the, you know, the books. And I think books are by far the, way, the best leverage that you can get yeah. because what happens is you're getting somebody 10 or 20 years down to like a four hour window. Absolutely. You are leveraging their decades of experience in a four hour snippet. You're leveraging the financing of a bank of other people's money to exponentially. You're leveraging other people's time. Right. But all of that has to fit inside the construct of a system or it's all for naught, like Alice in Wonderland. Yeah. If you don't know which way you want to go, it doesn't really matter which way you go. So having those, and those are each one of the things I've systematically had to figure out through failure. But now I don't need to make those same mistakes. Use the wisdom of people like you yeah. uh, that have walked the path before and said, don't do this or look at it. And, you know, utilizing all of those things in your, your entrepreneurial journey. Yeah, it's ironic. So my background for, for you know, for the last 20 years is an affiliation association with Keller Williams and knowing Gary and, and knowing Jay. And, you know, you talk about, he talks about in the millionaire real estate agent, how in order to break through that entrepreneurial ceiling, you have to have systems and you have to have leverage. And, you know, it's funny that you mentioned that because almost to the T, Jake, almost to the T, every entrepreneur that's been on our show for the last two years has mentioned people leverage as part of one of the ceilings that had to break through. And, and because as entrepreneurs, we always want to do it ourselves, right? We always want to control it. And, and that's what a lot of people did to get to that, that initial level. So let me ask you this question. What's the biggest thing in that entrepreneurial journey that's kind of surprised you or take, took you back a bit? I mean, there's a lot of them, uh, you know, <laughs> there always is, <laughs> um, you know, I, I guess I thought, you know, initially in that it was going to be this, like this complete parabolic growth, but it's in, in, in you know, Darren Hardy's the entrepreneurial roller coaster, right? The ups and downs of it. And, and oftentimes you're going to find that the people that are closest to you are your biggest naysayers, your biggest people that are trying to hold you back. Yes. And then I think from that discovery is, is maybe that's the one, a, the one B is all limitations are self limitations of your mindset. Yeah. And I'll yeah. give you an interesting story on that is I went back to school. I, I, you know, sobbing on the street corner, praying to be worth no money. I went back to school. I went and got a, a master's degree in international real estate and finance. And I was like, you know, I'm going to do real estate forever. I'm going to do, and I'm going to build a skyscraper. Like I'm going to, and that's one of my goals, bucket list, build skyscraper. Okay. Um, and I was down in Miami and I was just like, you know, you, you kind of read my bio. I need to do hundreds of millions of dollars worth of transactions. I need to have all this experience. I need to do this. And then in my vision is that I will then be worthy and skill set enough to develop a, a skyscraper. I met a kid and I say kid, he was probably 28, you know, late twenties. And he had just finished a, I want to say 37, 40 story condo project in Miami. Okay. It was the first project he's ever done in his life. Oh, wow. And I was just like, tell me more. Like, this is what I want to do. Like sure. when I grow up, even though I'm older than him at the time, you know, I was like, when I want to grow up. I want to do what you just did. Like, tell me. And he's like, three years ago, I came to the country. I had no money. I have no experience. I've never done this before. I've never, I just literally went and bought the land that was on the market for what it was listed for. I went down the street. There was a contractor and an architect doing another project. And I said, Hey, I want to do another one down the street here. Can you do the plans and tell me what the cost is? And so they put together this project. He's like, I just kind of walked around the street and went to some real estate meetups and says, Hey, I'm going to build this condo project. Who wants to invest with me? They invested it. We got it funded. People bought some of the condos. And so it cost him, I want to say $70 million 
he sold the entire project out for $125 million, netting $25 million profit from the first deal that he ever did three years ago. He wasn't even in the country. He's got no credit, no experience, no anything. And he just walked into it and did it because it was there and available on the market. Yeah. And so that to me was, I have a lot of friends that are immigrants that just this mentality of just doing it. And, you know, again, all limitations are self limitations. And I sat there and it shook me to my core that I was just sitting there like thinking how much of this things that exist in my everyday existence is just because I believe that I can't do that until I get to that certain yeah. mile marker until I get to those other things. And someone else is doing your dreams with less just because they went out and created and did the action of it. Yeah. Well, you know, you said, you said n not in the country, no money, no experience, also no limiting beliefs. That it just, that was it. That was it. So he oh believed that America is the land of opportunity. He yeah. came here and I can do anything in this country. Yeah. Wow. What a great story. Oh my gosh. Did you give me chills when you're talking about it? So when's the, when's the skyscraper? I think I have the land. Uh, it's Good a couple of land. We have a parking garage. We're converting the 10 story office building to apartments right now. Uh, believe the parking structure and we're, we're working on some financing mechanisms for that. Uh, I think I can do 32, maybe 40 stories. Good for you. Uh, well, so. we'll look forward to, uh, to seeing it, Jake, cause I know you're going to make it happen. So let's shift gears. So you write this book called catching knives, right? And I mean, it's an interesting title, and yet about it's about buying commercial uh, distressed commercial real estate. So talk to us ab about that and, and, you know, what what people can really learn from the book and what they can learn from um, what you're doing right now. So I thought there was going to be a lot of distress in the market right now. Uh, you know, you know everyone, that, didn't a lot of people think that right, like coming out of COVID, like, you know, I was kind of like. I know how to do this. Like I'm really good at buying distress and buying the foreclosures and jumping into these deals. And I was like, this is the time. Yeah. This is the book that I need to write is to get that message out there is these are the systems that need to be put in place. There's going to be distress. There's going to be retail centers and office buildings and everything. And they're all going to be on sale and there's going to be, and then the government went and printed $20 trillion. Yeah. Again, I mentioned that. And all real estate like doubled or tripled at that same time period. So not only was there not a lot of distress, but it went the complete opposite direction. So my crystal ball is really fuzzy. Um, however, like you mentioned, there is distress in all markets. There's distress in markets that go up. There's distress in markets that go down. And really what I talked to was the fundamental structures of a system of understanding a business plan, right. how to execute that, Real estate is a team sport. Just as you mentioned, the, the people that are in, you don't have to know all the stuff. Just as sure. that kid in Miami, he didn't know how to build the building, but he hired the people that knew how to build the building. Just as you can raise funds, you can do these. And so when that is, there are a lot of things, and especially for early commercial real estate investors, I think people that are looking to transition from residential to commercial, the book has a lot of applicable skill sets, you know, due diligence things, understanding of the mechanisms that you're looking or, or trying to develop so that you understand the game plan and what you're involving. And sometimes real estate, and especially in the commercial, and the reason the whole catching knives title is in the financial world, the stock market, they say, don't catch falling knives. Just wait until the bottom's out. Wait until right. it falls and hits the floor. When your Tesla stock goes from 420 down to, you know, 69, you buy it at 69 and then it goes back up. Well, in commercial real estate, these are assets that maybe only sell once a generation. Yeah. Downtown Minneapolis, Minnesota may have an office building, a trophy office building or hotel or something like that, it only sells once every 30 or 40 years. And if you're not prepared, you don't have the systems, you don't have the game plan, you're going to miss the opportunity to invest or buy that when it's on a discount. Yeah. 
And so then putting together the framework and doing the homework and doing the things that you need to before you make that investment is going to allow you to move more efficiently, more confidently. It's going to allow you to put together funds, you know, and get a banker along the, the lines, everything else, because you've done the proper planning out of the gate. So I love what you said, and I think people struggle with this, like you don't need to do it all yourself, right? You don't need to find all the money yourself. You don't need to, you know, do all the due diligence, so to speak, for yourself. I mean, I think it's important for a team. So let me ask you two questions. One, it'll, I'll be real interested. So my logical mind says, we've got a whole bunch of people not going back to offices. We've got the great resignation going on where they're actually, you know, moving away from companies and doing things independently, gig economy, whatever you want to call it. Why is commercial real estate still seeming to go up? Well, because a lot of leases are 10 years. You know, you, you, you can't turn the, the Titanic that fast. Um, okay. So when you have an office lease, that, you know, yeah. sometimes there's 20 year office leases. Yeah. You may have people working less. You may have people working remotely. And also what you're now starting to see is the data and the feedback that's coming is the um, ex the exception is the few very tech centric companies that are able to efficiently work from home or remote. Yeah. The people want to work from home in their pajamas, yeah. but the reality is that productivity has significantly yeah. dropped yeah. off. And so when you're looking in HR is like, Hey guys, we need people yeah. together. The CFO is saying, if we got rid of all of our real estate, look at how much money we could save because we don't have these office leases. Sure. But the reality is most people leave jobs not for money. Yeah. It's yeah. because of the people that they connect with. It's because of the people that, that they're friends with. It's the, those things. And so I believe in a world that is even more digitally connected with more Instagram friends and Facebook friends and Zoom meetings and other things like that. People feel lonelier, more disconnected and more seek community than ever before. Yeah. And that's obviously part of the, the underlying thesis that I have about hospitality and how hospitality will continue to emerge its way into commercial real estate is if you can develop an architect the connection of human to human people, you're yeah. going to win long-term because we're tribal. We need yeah. other people. We need yeah. to connect with others. And as much as the CFOs are going to say, we can just get rid of the real estate. The reality is, is us as humans, we need to connect yeah. with other people. We yeah, need it's, not a surprise it's not a surprise productivity is going down, right? I mean, it's not real hard to figure out. And yet it took some time. And, you know, if I'm the person, and I've fortunately never been this person, but if I was the person who was having to drive an hour, hour and a half each way in traffic every day, I'd, I'd be like, hey, I don't want to go back to the office anymore just because I don't want to deal with that. So I absolutely get it. So, so talk about, I'm going to ask this one last question and then we'll shift gears a little bit. Talk about the opportunities right now. Like where's your future? I know you said your crystal ball was a little fuzzy. However, I, I think it's probably a lot clearer than most. What do you see? I mean, I'm in real estate, so I've been in real estate forever. Yet I'm on the residential side. What do you see happening on the commercial side? Well, so, um, California, the West coast, Seattle, Portland, is doing an amazing job for real estate of driving people out of California, the West Coast, and then things. Uh, whether that's the taxation, the politics, the you know lockdowns, the mandates, whatever it is, yeah. they're doing a fantastic job of driving people to Boise and Salt Lake and Phoenix and Texas. And you know, subsequently on the other side of the country, the Northeast is doing the same thing and driving people down to the Carolinas and Tennessee and Florida and Texas. And so right. what you exactly said is there's a convergence in population climb that's moving for whatever reason. And people that move on their own are actually, here's one of the interesting statistics that a lot of people say, well, all these people from California are moving to Texas. Texas will now all of a sudden be a lot more, yeah, you know, maybe it. liberal, you know, yeah. leaning and not as conservative. People that move on their own volition are moving. And when they move to a location, they're moving because that's more in alignment with their 
beliefs of that areas and their values. However, when it's a company that is relocating and they're dragging their employees with those employees are subsequently oftentimes aligned with where the the company was before. You have both of that happening in Texas and Florida and others, but there is to your uh, component a a shift, an informational demographic shift, uh, uh, people that are moving and resetting this kind of country over. And so when we look at that, as I look at where are the people moving, the job growth, the population growth, the affordability index, the access to fun, exciting things. And, and again, to that connection point, dating, you know, if you're a young person, you know, you still want to connect with other people. You know, you want to find your your partner in life. Yeah. Uh, where that happens, where that proximity, again, fun activities all align those. And so what we do is we use a um, an investment thesis that just tries to get in front of that, ride that wave. And so we're not necessarily trying to create the wave or, you know, we're just paddling like a little surfer, seeing this wave crest and get in front of it. Sure. Most of my successful exits have been to institutional capital. And so when I look at that as it's secondary or tertiary markets that haven't quite seen institutional capital yet from the yeah. primary markets of New York, Chicago, San Francisco, LA. Now what happens is subsequent from the, the Denver's and the Dallas's to the next. And so for instance, I'm investing in Milwaukee because right. Chicago does, you know, what it does. And it right. drives people out to Wisconsin and Milwaukee. Uh, I'm significantly investing in, in San Antonio. Yeah. Austin, I already did a lot of investment there. I wish I would have bought more in 2015 and 16, but that's a rocket ship that is maybe taken off unless sure. you can tweet out a dog face on, you know, and have your cryptocurrency go up like five or $6 billion. Yeah. You don't know how you make some of those deals pencil in Austin. However, subsequent, you know, down market opportunities. Yeah. Just like Sacramento was to San Francisco, like look at these other second tier cities, you know, Nashville to Chattanooga or, you know, Charlotte to Asheville, you know, and so what we look at is where are these people moving? Where are the jobs? Where's affordability? Where's access to those? And then we invest in those market and assemble little, little portfolios that we can then sell off. Not only do we get good yield yeah. on our initial going in cash flow, but then we have a compressed cap rate that we can sell it off to the institutionals because they want the tried and true proven model that sure. exists. We can just move a little bit faster when there's a, a one or two Z's of opportunity that's starting to, to emerge in those markets. So let me ask you one last question. And I haven't prepared you for this and, and you may or may not be able to answer it, but 2007, 2008, you know, we hit the bottom and, you know, a lot of people think it was partly the government that in residential, now I'm talking residential. So I'm going to tap your institutional hat for a second. We, we put a lot of money into the market. We brought buyers out, got them, you know, gave them an opportunity to buy um, single family residential houses. But there was a lot of investor investment money at that time, you know, that bought a lot of single family houses. And we're in this huge inventory shortage right now in a lot of markets in the country. And I think in part, and this is why I'm looking for your, your perspective, I think in part, a little bit of that is those institutional investors haven't put those properties back on the market, which tells me they're still not feeling like we're at the top of the market yet. Cause they're always really good at that, right? They're always good at the bottom and they're always good at the top. Am I hallucinating in this thought process or is there any type of reality to, to what I'm thinking? They're never going to sell. So, uh, so to, 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 to give you your point is, um, Institutional investors, Blackstone, Invitation yep. Homes, Colony Capital, Tricon, the others, I've sold to them. I've, you know, worked uh, within some of those organizations is it wasn't until the subsequent subprime meltdown that they've ever entered into single family rentals as a new asset class. And so they didn't buy homes before that. Right. So 
early 2000s, it was, you know, you've seen the movie Big Short. It was the, the, the stripper that owned eight houses in Vegas, you know, off of no income. It was people coming from LA over to Phoenix and buying, you know, three, four, five, six houses. By the time it was built, it went up $75,000 in, in value. Yep. They never lived in it. So we were overbuilding and oversupplying the, you know, residential, you know, units that we needed as a country. And so there was an overbuilt environment in the mid 2000s, you know, 2003, four, five, six, overbuilding, overbuilding, overbuilding from, you know, the, the demand. There's about a million new residential units that we need every single year from jet net population growth, immigration growth, other things like that. There's some, right. you know, call that does not account for, like you said, institutional buyers taking some of these and buying them and taking them off the market. That factors not just single family homes, but also rentals, oh, residential really, apartments yeah, in yeah. total. And so what happens is we underbuilt the market. We stopped building in 08, yeah. you know, 9, 10, yeah. 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17. So what, you know, we needed a, a million net. We had an oversupply. And if you actually track this just to supply and demand is underbuilt, 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 underbuilt. In about 2012, we equaled and had equilibrium. Pricing was moving and falling down from 08, 9, 10, 11, 12. Like sure. when I was buying houses in 09, we were looking at the market, the house is going to be worth less in six months than it is right now. How can we time this and price it appropriately that we make, you know, when we were buying it at a big enough discount? In 2012, when that equilibrium of pricing of supply and, you know, uh, built units, the prices, and if you look back subsequently, that's when the prices of real estate have only gone up from sure. 2012 up until 2022. And we've underbuilt in 2012 and 13 and 14 and 15 and 16 and 17. And so that amount of unbuilt or unmet demand has been growing and growing and growing. And we're currently sitting somewhere at four and a half to five million residential units short in the United States. It is not evenly dispersed across the United States. Right. It is not like there's parts of Ohio or Illinois or Indiana or other things in the Rust Belt where they have more houses and the very stagnation of homes that people don't really want that much or right. in a very low price. And so when you look at that, again, to the demographics of looking, it is much more focused on where the job growth, the population growth and, and the clients are moving. And so you're having a heavily weighted structure into the the sun belt you know arizona to to florida and kind of smiled up so when you look at that is we do not have capacity to build enough houses or apartments to chip away at that demand yet even at record building home building activity and apartment sure. building activity where you can only at best chip away about a half a million homes a year and if we have a 5 million home deficit, it could take a decade for us to get back to equilibrium from, from pricing. And so and that's where the institutional capital is looking at this is we will have rent growth, price appreciation. Yeah. And, and what, and really we're facing a ceiling on home building activity because of the price of material, the yeah. price of permits, the price of land is I also believe we're not going to be able to supply the demand that exists. And that's only going to cause real estate prices to go up and up and up in an inflationary environment. And so you have to look at that in a different lens than what it was like in 2000 yeah. Yeah. and what it is there. And it's, it's a different kind of a, a couple cycles back to yeah. where we see that real estate could have fundamentally speaking, a very good next decade. That yeah. doesn't factor into <laughs> how, money. Yeah, <laughs> how it works in mastering market cycles is yeah. consumer demand because yeah. you can have fantastic fundamentals, but if people just don't want to buy anymore or they right. want to continue to room up or they want to do other things or the sentiment shifts, it doesn't yeah. matter sometimes what the fundamentals are. So you have two teeter-tottering effects that if they're in both in alignment, you see what is happening right now and double-digit uh, price, price growth in almost every single market. Yeah. Well, and, 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 you know, I appreciate you giving that clarity from the, 
you know, having the insight in the institutional side, because that, you know, I've been a real estate since 1987. So I, and, and, you know, I've, I've watched this as a, you know, as a franchise owner, as a coach, as a consultant. And, and I just, I, I felt like, yeah, there was something different and you just validated it. Not only is it different from the institutional perspective, that it's different for other factors, like at no other time we've probably experienced in our generation. And so that's why in my, the, the reason I asked that is a lot of the people that I coach and consult with, I'm like, this inventory shortage is not going to go away for a while. And the only thing that would bring it back is massive numbers of properties, which isn't going to happen on the build side and isn't going to happen on the institutional side. So th thanks so much for sharing that. I think it's just amazing perspective. So let's shift gears, and, and this has been awesome, Jake. In fact, we've gone longer than we talked about going, so hopefully you got a still a few more minutes. I, I, I do. I, I, I have more time, so I, I am uh, fine for that. Good, um, good. Well, you, you've just been providing such great insight. What's the best advice that you've ever been given that hopefully you followed, and what did you learn? Oh, man, there's been so many people that have helped me along my uh, along my path. So uh, I'd say number one is I mentioned earlier leverage of books. It took me until my 30s to really start reading. Um, it, it is unbelievable the amount of information that you can extract from books. I know yeah. podcasts like this. I know video snippets and YouTubes and things like that have value, but I think it's also a much smaller leveraged amount of information that you can get. And so I would say read books, read, 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 and, and encourage that. And if you don't like reading, read what you do like yeah. until you get, and then that becomes a habit that you can create that. And I'm trying to instill that and then set that into my kids is to get them that love of reading, because I think it is the one consensus thing that almost everyone that I have met that has been successful yeah, is an man, avid man. reader. Yeah. I'd say well, almost every single one, maybe yeah. there's one or two that are dyslexic and they have a hard time doing things, but they listen to audiobooks or they're in person with those people. Yeah. But without fault, I believe it is reading is the number one best advice that I could possibly give. Well, and I loved what you said earlier, and, and I I mean I get exactly, but you said condenses, you know, books condense down 20 years of people's learning into, you know, a four hour read. And I mean, oh my gosh, what a, what a great perspective. So, so let's tip that upside down. What's the worst advice that you've ever been given that hopefully you didn't follow? And if you did, what did you learn? Uh, my worst advice was probably my own uh, advice. <laughs> <laughs> and it was that real estate's never going to go down. Uh, you know, it was like, oh, man, I don't know what you old timers are thinking. No, real estate always goes up. My, the real estate market would have to go down 20%. For me to, you know, uh, go underwater, what do you yeah. mean I shouldn't use uh, copious amounts of leverage? Uh, so that was the worst advice was listening to myself as, a, and when there was opposite and opposing ad advice out there. So yeah. again, yes, there are limitations. They're all your own self limitations, but also don't believe your own bullshit. Yeah. Well, you know, in 2007, 2008, remember we thought the world was, you know, collapsing, right? And the one thing that uh, Gary Keller always said, he says, real estate's never gone to zero. Like find a place where real estate's ever gone to zero. It's just, it just never has, right? I mean, it, for, I'm sure there's an exception to the rule. Um, and yet you look at 2007, 2008, you look at how long it took to come back from a massive, you know, bottom shift. And it wasn't all that long. You know, it seemed like longer, but it wasn't all that long. So that's that's uh, that's great, uh, great advice, uh, not uh, to what you talked about. So, Jake, you've been amazing. I'm going to give you a minute here to just give uh, kind of think about a final thought. I'm going to do a little PSA. So, uh, ladies and gentlemen, thanks so much for listening. We truly appreciate um, your support. And you can always get updates at the success ascent dot com. You can go to any of your favorite podcast source sources and subscribe, uh, leave us feedback, ratings, comments, all those great things, because we just truly appreciate what you do. And we do this uh, for you. So any support is always, always appreciated. So Jake, uh, take us uh, out here. What's a final thought? And then I'm going to share your website. And as it's scrolling on and bottom, give us some final thoughts. Well, I think it, it, I would give it more to mindset because I think that is the other big leverage that or lever that you can pull is understanding your own makeup, 
what is your dream life? What do you actually want? Um, many people have this FOMO and they're running in the direction that they don't really even know. Like they just, uh, and I'll give you an example of that was someone wanted uh, to make $2 million a year. And somebody asked and they said, why? And because, you know, like it sounded like a big amount of money that they yeah. wanted to, uh, but then it was like, why do you want that? And they said, well, my dream life, uh, you know, would, you know, things. And so when they actually broke it down and said, like, what is your dream life cost? You want uh, an Italian villa, you want to drive a sports car, you, you know, have a private jet doing those other things. And when you actually break things down into that, that vision is, you know, he realized that he only needed to make $685,000 a year. And you know what? He was already making a million dollars a year. So he was like, you, the realization that he could achieve and have his dream life. And he was going to have to trade away his time, which is by far and away the most precious thing that we have on this planet earth. Money's fake. Time is precious and finite. You cannot make more time. You can make more money. Yeah. I keep dry. I keep looking for the drive through franchise where I can buy more time in every city I go to. And I still haven't found it yet. So I, I am with you there. So I'm scrolling. We're scrolling right now. Uh, your website where folks can uh, go and what are they going to get when they go to uh, catching knives, catching hyphen knives, my slash sales page. Yeah. So that's the, the, the Kajabi page is a course that we recently just put together for due diligence for triple net lease deals. So we're seeing a lot of people, you know, wanting to get into passive investments and mailbox money. And I actually created that for my mastermind tribe. So, I mean, obviously as people, I, I think, more people that get on that live kind of coaching session, there'll be some value to it. The catch knives.com is where they can go to sign up for the newsletter, other blog posts, um, you know, content. I'm most active on uh, Instagram at jake.realestate is where I'm most active on, on Instagram. And again, we're going to be releasing some awesome things like that NFT project. We're going to be you know, offering out some of those things as well. So um, we're doing, and, and that was the other next step was instead of consuming content, obviously reading books, I talk about that, but um, creating content. And we're working on creating a lot of content right now, uh, specifically through some of those channels. I'm very excited about it. I love it. I love it. Well, Jake, Jake, thanks so much uh, for your time today. We really appreciate it. It's an honor to have you on the show. And uh, we just, you, you delivered a, a 10 uh, today. So thank you so much. We appreciate it. I appreciate it. Hopefully it's not out of a scale of like 100 though. No, it's a scale of 10 out of 10. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Well, ladies and gentlemen, our listeners, as I uh, end every show, be happy, be healthy, be safe until the next time we see you. Take care.